Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for coming. A lot of you probably have been wondering what on earth has been happening to quantitative history over the past century or so. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so with the help of Professor Magnuson, just referenced, as well as undergraduates Emily DeChase, Greg Kohler, Kerry Peterson, and Chase Barr, I collected a bunch of data, and I think I figured it out. <laughs> Today, I'm going to talk about three waves of quantification uh, by American historians. I'm going to start by talking about the new history of the progressive era, mainly between 1915 and 1940. Then I'm going to talk about the new histories of the 1960s through the 1980s, including the new economic history, the new political history, and the new social history. And finally, I'm going to dis discuss the revival of quantitative history in history and across the social sciences. So the first reference to the new history in the American Historical Review appeared in 1898, just two and a half years after the journal was founded. It described the social statistical method of history, expanding the purview of history beyond politics to economics and society more general, uh, and, and leveraging social science and pursuing an inductive quantitative approach. The new history that emerged in the United States in the early 20th century, for the most part, rejected the idea that history was an objective science. In a 1911 paper that became a 1912 book, James Harvey Robinson argued that historians should promote understanding of the present, provide guidance into the future. This echoes Frederick Jackson Turner's 1891 dictum that each age writes the history of the past anew with reference to the conditions uppermost in its own time. Robinson further argued that the subject matter has to measure, uh, go beyond politics, diplomacy, and war. It should use the data and methods from anthropology, psychology, economics, and sociology, and it should focus on the history of the common man. A lot of, of these new historians began to explore history from the bottom up. In his 1922 opus, new historian Arthur Schlesinger discussed the working man who has not received a fair share of the enormous increase of wealth achieved largely through his own grinding labor. The same volume has chapters on the influence of immigration and the role of women. The latter topic was the chief focus of Mary Beard, who argued forcefully for the centrality of women in history and the need to incorporate women into the mainstream of historical writing. The new historians of the early 20th century were openly reformist and activist. They embraced statistics and cross-fertilization with the social sciences, but most were also relativists. A lot of them thought historical objectivity was impossible. The new historian who was the sharpest critic of scientific history and objectivity was Carl Becker. He was a student of both Robinson and Turner. In his famous 1931 AHA presidential address, Every Man a Historian, Becker argued that history is a fictional reconstruction of the past. Becker especially argued that past vanished events are intrinsically unknowable, anticipating the postmodern turn. Becker wrote that the form and substance of historical facts, having a negotiable existence only in literary discourse, vary with the words employed to convey them. Two years later, 
Charles Beard echoed Becker's sentiment, arguing that the noble dream of scientific objectivity in history was just an illusion. As the new historians turned away from narrative political history and started exploring materialist explanations, a lot of them started turning to statistical evidence. That doesn't mean that they had a huge volume of tables and graphs. Beard's landmark economic interpretation of the Constitution, it's got numbers on almost every page, but there's only a half a dozen tables in the whole thing. This is one of them. And this was partly a matter of cost. You couldn't have graphs. Before the introduction of photocomposition and offset printing by the journals, and that began in the 1960s, graphs were generally prohibitively expensive to produce. You had to make engraved plates and, and tables uh, uh, that have proportional fonts. They were also pretty expensive and they were used frugally. Nevertheless, these guys did publish a lot of tables. This is the percentage of articles with statistical tables in the American Historical Review. The average in the progressive era from 1915 to 44 was five times as high as the average at the turn of the century. Robinson and Beard, published in the early days of the first quantitative boom, Becker came just before the decline. The new historians, initially they were insurgents, but they became the establishment. Turner, Robinson, Beard, Schlesinger, and Becker all served as American Historical Association presidents and the new historians were very well represented on the editorial offices of the American Historical Review. After the war, the new historians were toppled. The consensus historians of the post-war years didn't like the relativism of Becker and the other new historians. They didn't like their leftist slant. They didn't like their materialist explanations. The coming of World War II and the Cold War bolstered historians' faith in their ability to uncover objective truth. Relativism came under attack. Becker, and especially Beard, were excoriated by the prominent historians of the day. They were accused of treason against the profession. Instead, the Cold War his consensus historians of the 40s and 50s celebrated objectivity patriotism, and narrative style. Here's another look at the older new history of the progressive era. This is a graph of the frequency of the three-word phrase, the new history. In books scanned by Google in the period 1890 to 1959, and this is expressed as the number of occurrences per million trigrams. A trigram is just any three-word phrase. Well, <clears throat> um, the pattern is pretty much identical to the pattern of quantification in the American Historical Review. The numbers took off right after 1910, peaked in the 1920s, and declined sharply after 1940. There was a revival of quantification beginning in the second half of the 1960s. Here's the percentage of articles in the American Historical Review that contained a table or graph between 1955 and 2009. Now you may wonder why there's a dip uh, in the mid-1970s just when historical quantification was at the height of fashion. Well, according to Barbara Hanawalt, who was associate editor at the time, the then editor, Bob Quirk, told her that under his editorship, the AHR would never publish a quantitative history article. So to mitigate the idiosyncrasies of individual editors, we can look at multiple journals simultaneously. This is the percentage of articles in the American Historical Review, the Journal of American History, the Journal of Modern History, and Past and Present that contained a table or graph. Uh, um, and, and here's a, it's, it's a little more dramatic. Here's another measure uh, based on the same four journals. This measure takes into account 
the number of tables and graphs per thousand pages of articles. By this indicator, quantification in mainstream historical journals rose some 800% from 1964 to the peak just 12 years later. And then it began a gradual three-decade decline. <laughs> My timing could have been a little better. <laughs> so what caused the second boom in historical statistics? Once again, it was the new history. But this time, there were three distinct new histories, each with its own origin story. The first on the scene was the new economic history. Here's the Google trigram for the frequency of the phrase new economic history relative to all other three word phrases in the books scanned by Google. It began to show up in books in 1962. There's a bit of a lag, of course, because books take a while to publish. It took off rapidly after 1965. The phrase new economic history was uh, coined by this guy, Douglas North. And he wrote, for the new economic historian, explanation entails the application of the principles of scientific explanation derived from the natural sciences. This is a very different conception from the new history of the progressive era. Uh, the, the, the new economic historians felt their inquiries were entirely objective. And they also thought that their assumptions had no political content whatsoever. <laughs> The second of the newer new histories was the new political history. In terms of its topical focus, the new political history was narrower than the other new histories. It was mostly concerned with the analysis of voting statistic and statistics and legislative roll calls. It never became as visible as the other two new histories, but the new political history is absolutely critical part of the story because the new political historians built crucial institutions. None of us would be here today if it were not for the institution building of the new political historians. The central figure in the development of the new political history was Lee Benson, who in 1957 published a manifesto condemning impressionistic analysis of American elections, calling for systematic quantitative analysis. He denounced the traditional method of historical documentation as proof by haphazard quotation. <laughs> he called the accumulated historical knowledge of, uh, uh, as bits of information of a degree of triviality stupefying to comprehend. The goal of history, he thought, was to discover general laws of human behavior. He explicitly rejected the subjective relativist perspective that characterized the progressive era new historians. So Benson was an objectivist like the new economic historians, but he was a leftist like the older new historians. He was committed to the development of a data bank, a data bank in which quantitative political data could be stored in machine readable form, freely available to anybody who wanted to use it. This is a really radical innovation for this period. At this time, data was considered the prized jewels of the highly protected property of the scholar that produced it. But Benson had a different view, and he convinced the American Historical Association to establish a committee on quantitative data. And then he convinced the Institute for Social Research in Ann Arbor to publish, a his, to establish a historical archive and disseminate data through the Inter-University Consortium for Political Research. And he and other new political historians raised a lot of grant money to build data sets covering historical census tabulations and election returns. When the AHA decided to shut down the Committee on Quantification in 1971, 
Benson and seven other new political historians organized the Social Science History Association at a meeting at ICPR, ICPR in Ann Arbor. Benson became the first president of the new association. Given Benson's view that qualitative history is haphazard quotation, and given that SSHA was established because the American Historical Association shut down its Committee on Quantitative Data, you might assume that the new association would be militantly quantitative. You would assume wrong. In fact, the SSHA welcomed qualitative approaches from the very beginning. The reason for the acceptance of qualitative work in SSHA was that from the very beginning of the association, most of the SSHA membership came from the third kind of new history. The third new history was the new social history. It blossomed later than the other two new histories. It had a distinctly different character. A lot of new social historians didn't use quantitative methods. It was, a, it was much more heterogeneous than the other new histories. It was a big tent. Unlike the other new histories, there's no consensus on an origin story. A lot of people point to the influence of the, the French analysts or the British neo-Marxist social historians. But I think that at least in the United States, American new social historians owed more to the new historians of the progressive area than they did to any European models. Arguably, the first new social historian was Merle Curti, who in 1959 published a study of a frontier community in Wisconsin. It's a, a 19th century community study built around individual level census uh, records together with qualitative material. Hundreds of new social history studies over, over the subsequent three decades followed exactly that same template. The book used punch cards and IBM sorting machines to link individuals across four censuses, and, and, the, and it includes almost 100 graphs and tables. He was able to do the analysis by enlisting the help of his wife. She was a PhD social psychologist. She'd, she'd written dozens of books and articles based on statistical analysis. The Curtis look a lot like the new historians of the progressive era, especially in this picture. <laughs> Merle Curdy was a student of both Frederick Jackson Turner and Arthur Schlesinger Sr. Margaret and Merle were socialists. They were activists. With respect to political commitment, the new social historians resembled the new historians of the progressive era. Like the old new historians, most of the new social historians, they were politically engaged, they were activists, they were inspired by the political movements of the 1960s and 1970s, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, and above all, the women's liberation movement. As Richard Vann expressed it in 1976, the politics of the new social historians ranged from liberal to Marxist, conservative social historians being no more numerous than Republican folk singers. <laughs> Stephen Thernstrom, the most widely read of the new social historians, explicitly identified with the new left. He was defined, described by Joan Scott as an exemplary radical historian. The new social history began with community studies of social and geographic mobility, but it quickly spread to a wide assortment of other areas, including family history, history of childhood and old age, a historical demography, urban history, history of education. If the new social historians had one common precept, it was to write history from the bottom up. 
like the new history of the progressive era, the new social history was concerned with the experiences of common people, and especially the history of workers, African Americans, immigrants, and women. So here's my summary, my characterization uh, of the different kinds of new history. The progressive era new history used quantification within the practical limits of what was feasible at the time, and it was politically engaged and relativist. The new economic history and the new political history, they were defined by their use of quantification. Both of them were highly objectivist. The new economic history rarely acknowledged any kind of political perspective or motive, but the new political history sometimes did. But the new social history, well, it looks an awful lot like the new history of the progressive era. Like the progressive era new history, the new social history had lots of quantifiers, but quantification was not universal. And like the new history, the new social history was generally leftist and activist. The new social history was heterogeneous with respect to the spectrum from relativist to objectivist. A lot of new social historians Mostly, they didn't care much about epistemology, but most of them rejected the, the extreme positivism of the new economic historians. The broad similarities of the progressive era new history and the new social history are no coincidence. I think that the new social history was essentially a revival of the old new history of the progressive era. Quantification in history began to decline rapidly after 1980. We've already seen the hostility to quantification in the American Historical Association, the threat to shut down the Committee on Quantitative Data in 1971, the pronouncement of the AHR editor in 1975. They were just part of a fierce reaction to quantification by the historical establishment. Unlike the older new history, the newer new historians never overtook the establishment of the profession. They remained insurgent from the 1960s to the 1980s, and the conservative establishment fought back fiercely. As early as 1962, Carl Breidenbau <laughs> condemned the bitch goddess quantification in his American Historical Association presidential address. In the same speech, he suggested that Jews and people of lower middle class or foreign origins made lousy historians. <laughs> the neoconservative Gertrude Himmelfarb objected to the new social history precisely because it was history from the bottom up. Himmelfarb maintained that the elites are the proper focus of history and that the natural mode of historical writing is narrative. The most, oh, there's Stone. Oh, yes, the most influential criticism of the new histories and quantification came from Lawrence Stone. The Revival of Narrative was published in 1979. It's been cited just about 1,200 times. Stone was a reformed quantifier himself, and the revival of narrative was an indictment of quantification. Stone attacked the large-scale projects in which squads of diligent assistants <laughs> assemble data, <laughs> encode it, program it, and pass it through the maw of the computer all under the autocratic direction of a team leader. I know that this sounds like a perfect description of Ippum's. <laughs> but it was actually a decade before Ippum's came along. Stone did not explicitly mention the Philadelphia Social History Project, but he had to have it in mind 
PSHP, as it was called, was the largest historical research project ever undertaken. It had garnered about $2 million in funding between 69 and 81 to conduct this massive study of Philadelphia. In the spring of 1978, a year and a half before Stone's revival of narrative appeared, I faced the difficult choice of going to graduate school at Princeton to work with Lawrence Stone on the history of the family, or going to Penn because of PSHP. I went to Penn. <laughs> as it turned out, though, I, I went there just as the Philadelphia Project was dying, and I never did get access to any PSHP data. <laughs> A lot of historians thought that the Philadelphia Social History Project was a failure, that there was a big investment of money, there wasn't a lot of publications. The, the large sums of money raised by the quantifiers also contributed to fears of technological displacement. C. Van Woodward wrote that it's mainly our young who need to be protected. I find among them a mood of incipient panic a mounting fear of technological displacement and a disposition among a few to rush into the camp of the zealots. <laughs> well, the harsh attacks on quantification from traditionalist establishment historians were not the only factor in the decline in quantification in history in the 1980s and 1990s there was also the cultural turn. <laughs> now, few postmodern historians directly criticized the use of quantitative evidence. There was nothing like the vehement attacks that came from the traditionalists. But the cultural approach made quantification irrelevant. It was a turn away from social science and materialist explanation. There was broad skepticism about science in general. This is a picture of the rotating bar at the Hotel Monteleone in New Orleans. I remember a conversation at that bar at the 1991 meeting of the Social Science History Association. And the assembled group was a mixture of veterans and newcomers. And, but everybody agreed that it was highly unfortunate that SSHA had the word science in its title, <laughs> because science had become so disreputable in the field of history. The theory that the decline of quantification resulted from the rise of the cultural term has some plausible surface plausibility. This is the graph I showed you a moment ago, giving the percentage of articles and graphs, uh, 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 articles with tables or graphs in four mainstream history journals. Here's the percentage of articles in those journals that used variations on four terms used in the new cultural history. Discourse, which includes uh, uh, postmodern, postmodernist, postmodernism, et cetera, poststructural, and cultural turn. So the decline of quantification obviously occurred during the same period as the boom uh, in, in uh, uh, cultural uh, discourse. Unlike the new historians of the 60s through the 80s, the new uh, cultural historians did turn into the establishment of the profession. And they assumed important roles in the leading mainstream journals. A lot of new histor social historians made the cultural turn, including Joan Scott, William Sewell, and many other members of the SSHA. And I think that makes some sense. In some dimensions, the new cultural history resembles both the older new history and the new social history. So here's the classification I showed you before of the new histories on three dimensions. We can add the new cultural history to the list. The new cultural historians didn't quantify, but with respect to both political activism and relativism, the new cultural history was not all that different from the progressive era new history. A core postmodern idea that the interpretation of historical texts is subjective and contingent on the viewpoint of the interpreter is also the main point of Carl Becker. Well, 
my time is almost up, <laughs> so I ought to get to the point. As has been much discussed, the cultural turn has turned. What's not generally recognized is that we are in the midst of a revival of quantification, even within the discipline of history. Here's the older new history that I showed you before. Here are the newer new histories. Since what I haven't shown you is what happened after 2009. Since 2009, there's been a dramatic revival of quantitative history in the American <coughs> Historical Review. When we look at the four mainstream history journals as a group, the revival is a little bit smaller than if you just focus on the AHR, but you can see it quite clearly. The cultural turn has passed, and there are now fewer articles uh, in referencing these terms <laughs> than there are articles with tables or graphs. A lot of cultural historians, uh, uh, many historians who were new social historians, they made the cultural turn. A lot of them have turned back, and some have started counting again. <laughs> the revival of quantitative history is occurring not just in history journals, but across the uh, social sciences. Here's the top two political science journals, AJPS and APSR. Uh, um, historical graphs and tables here are defined as ones that use data that are more than three decades older than the publication date of the article. So there's a substantial rise. This is economics. Uh, you can see this is where Time on the Cross was published at the low point for quantitative history in, e in the top economic journals. Uh, when only 2.5% of their articles used historical data. By the time that Fogel and North won the Nobel Prize, it was up to 11%. Now it's 22%, uh, almost 10 times uh, as much as it was in the early 1970s. Here's sociology with about a six-fold increase since 1975. Here's the top two demography journals. Uh, uh, there was a huge surge in historical work after 2003. The percentage of historical analyses in the demography journals went from 8% to 33% in just five years. About a third of that surge <laughs> involved publications using IPM's data. Okay, here's the trend for the, uh, all, all the, the top eight journals, the top two journals in each social science field. Uh, and consider as a group, and you can see it smooths out a bit when you uh, uh, get some more cases, uh, and it's a steady and sustained increase in historical quantification since 1975. Finally, here's another way of looking at it. This is the absolute number of articles with historical tables and graphs. Together, these top journals now publish almost seven times as much quantitative history as they did 50 years ago. So. We are in a golden age of quantitative history. More is being produced at, than at any time in the past. So, so why is this happening? Well, I think there's a number of contributing factors. Uh, I don't, some of you who are older recall, technology used to be really hard. <laughs> and it was really expensive. Uh, as late as 1991, when, when IPMS was established, the costs for data storage and processing were 100,000 times what they are today. And the software is so much easier to use today, especially for visualization. We can make graphs and tables without resorting to ink <laughs> and pens. There's a wealth of new data. Uh, IPMS and the North Atlantic Population Project have made 1.2 billion cases of historical data, same definition, over 30 years old, uh, available uh, um, uh, on the internet. But the explosion of historical data goes far beyond IPMS and NAP. There are massive new longitudinal data sets from China, administrative records from Sweden, local uh, historical censuses from across uh, Europe. There's vast new archives of historical GIS data from around the world. There's new sources of climate data spanning hundreds of years. And the next frontier is text. Very soon, virtually the entire contents 
of the world's archives and libraries will be transformed into machine-readable form. We don't fully know how to capitalize on the computerization of the entire historical record, but it's bound to involve counting at some level. <laughs> so if we don't get on board, we could become irrelevant. If we focus on quantification among US historians, the roots, the revival of quantification have roots that go a lot deeper than just technology and data. Science is no longer in disrepute, especially in the age of Trump. Virtually all academics recognize the legitimacy of science. So the stigma of quantification has been disappearing. But it's more than that. The world is facing terrifying challenges in the face of climate change, globalization, surging inequality, and the rising electoral power of right-wing nationalists. The need for measurement is obvious. A quantitative historical perspective is essential for understanding the massive transformations that are changing the world. The crises we must address are inherently historical and they can't be understood without quantification. We can't even adequately describe the changes that are going on unless we measure them. And we certainly can't assess their causes and implement solutions. Historical interpretation provides perspective that's indispensable for understanding the present and guiding us into the future. Carl Becker wrote, the history that does work in the world, the history that influences the course of history is living history that enlarges and enriches the collective present. It's no accident that the first and second waves of historical quantification were spawned in the periods of leftist political activism. Their goal was to understand the conflicts of the present. Like the progressive era new historians and the new social historians, we need to make a usable history. The world needs it now more than ever. To maximize our effectiveness, this usable history has to leverage interdisciplinary interaction. Frederick Jackson Turner wrote that the economist, the political scientist, the sociologist, the geographer, all the allied laborers in the study of society have contributions to make to the equipment of the historian. That was right then, and it's right now. To address the urgent need for usable history, historians need the help of the social sciences. Quantifying historians should team up with historical social scientists who can provide technical exper expertise and help amplify our message. But at the same time, social scientists need historians. Deep immersion in particular periods and places can be indispensable for interpreting the meaning of historical data. SSHA is vital to the development and, uh, of interdisciplinary collaboration. It's the chief place where historians interact with other social scientists. If quantitative interdisciplinary social science history is truly revived, it's going to happen here. So you may ask, what can I do <laughs> to promote interdisciplinary engaged oops I'm supposed to have okay <laughs> I have an action item you can take right now to promote historical understanding of the world by interacting across disciplinary boundaries I have just three words red lacquer room <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you.